The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with the News Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals they're helping to shape it. Hope you're all well. Just a quick one from me to say that I will be chairing a panel at the upcoming Cannabis Europa conference in London at the end of June. The panel is entitled The Emperor's New Clothes. So hopefully we'll be separating hype from reality focusing on what cannabis can do well rather than claiming it can cure everything. I will be sharing a discount code for tickets on LinkedIn in the next couple of days with a few more details, so please look out for that. This theme is quite a live one, actually. My view of the world at large at the moment is that there is a fundamental lack of truth. Our world leaders exemplify that every day. But more concerning is that people don't seem to care that much It's all about what looks or sounds good rather than what actually is good. Social media clickbait reigns supreme and we're all complicit. And cannabis is full of hype, like any emerging industry, where there's a wide deficit of knowledge and people who are more than keen to exploit that. But I am actually seeing a slightly more mature approach of late, at least amongst the industry people I like and respect. Uh, A healthy scepticism and not blindly and uncritically accepting news that supports the cannabis story. Hopefully this means some much needed realism and a more balanced approach, which is a brilliant segue, if I do say so myself, into this week's show on myth busting, where we talk about a few of these things. Enjoy. On today's show, I have Dr. Kelly Seaman. Kelly is a cannabis scientist and researcher plus a host of other roles that she will talk about in a second. I'm extremely excited to have her on. She's a key thought leader in the UK medical cannabis scene. Kelly, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you on finally. How's it all going? Really good at the moment. It's since post-pandemic. I think we've really, uh, things have taken off. We're back at events, back seeing people, back hugging people. It it feels like things are getting going again. I don't don't know from your perspective of what you've been events. I know you've been out at Zurich lately. How's it feeling from your perspective? Exactly the same. I think, you know, it's so funny when you meet people that you've just been meeting on Zoom and then you realise actually everyone's a bit shorter than you think they are. (laughs) Well, that's my experience, but I don't know. <laughs> yes, that's right. I've done that one a couple of times where you, you yeah, oh, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I am very much welcoming this as all being in a room together again. So it's, it's great news. But yeah, look, you have fantastic personality in this space in the UK and you wear many, many hats, which we'll talk about in a second. Well, why don't you give us a bit of background about yourself, you know, how and why did you get into studying cannabis? Well, I mean, really, if we go back to the 1990s, back in 1995, I had a seizure and was diagnosed with epilepsy. And this is where the kind of it really all started. I was lucky enough to have a father who was forward of thinking enough to introduce me to cannabis to help control my seizures, to help sort of maintain sleep and things. We didn't have any hardcore data around it. We didn't have any research. There wasn't any out there. And it was kind of very difficult to find anything around. It was just something anecdotal that we'd been told. And I, that's kind of where it started. And my dad introduced me to the local hydroponic shop who I went to with him. And I went on to do a degree in biomedical sciences because I always wanted to develop drugs. It was what I wanted to do. I wanted to cure. I wanted to come up with the cure to HIV. That was one of my dreams when I was doing my A-levels. And wanted to work for a big pharmaceutical company. Worked for GlaxoSmithKline for a year and absolutely hated it. Came back from that and finished my degree off and went to work for the local hydro shop that I'd obviously been going in for many years. And then continued to work for them, helping develop nutrient ranges, um, helping to develop uh, different brands such as the Vitalink brand we, we originally actually developed there. Um, doing more and more research and during that time I did a PhD in fertilizer chemistry 
But unfortunately, that business went into administration. And uh, well, I say unfortunately, it was some ways it was a happy mishap for me because I started my own business called Aqua Laboratories from there. And we produced liquid fertilizers again for the hydroponic industry. And I'd spent a lot of time teaching people how to grow plants without soil. And that's kind of how I got into it. But we had obviously had the law change in 2018. And because I'd obviously been doing a lot of research and understood how to do research on plants, I started to get approached by different companies, licensed cultivation facilities and started working with those. And that's the kind of history from there. And now I'm regularly doing research on different cultivars and looking at stress techniques and how that actually alters the secondary metabolite profile of the plant. So looking at the cannabinoids, looking at the terpenes, looking at the flavonoids and how stressing that plant out, it makes it produce more or less because essentially if we look at why cannabis produces these compounds, it's as a defense mechanism. It's because it's been attacked either by insects or by herbivores or as a response to sunlight, as to act as a sunscreen. So all of these secondary metabolites have a stress response. So if we stress the plant, we can get more out of them. And that's kind of where my research is now kind of focused. But during this journey, I've been helping to educate people about cannabis as well. I know, which is a community interest company, which supports children with refractory epilepsy and families. So involved with PLEA, I've been on the advisory board for them, which is a patient access group as well. And as I say, I've got involved in many different kind of projects surrounding, particularly with the CIC, Cannabis Industry Council. I'm the chair of the subcommittee for Adult Youth Scope Group. So we are looking at the possibility and how the recreational market may have formed in other countries and how it may go forwards in this country, if and when it comes. Wow. Wow, you are a busy woman, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads of stuff. There's loads of stuff I want to pick up on there. Let's just go back to the stress bit around plants. Do you think that there's an issue with stressing the plant out too much, like forcing it to produce too much? Oh, with one hundred percent. So it's a fine balancing act between giving that stress so that you're encouraging the development of these secondary metabolites and not reducing yield. Because all of these stresses, because the energy the plant has to put into repairing, putting this defense mechanism out, isn't then going into biomass production. So it's a balancing act with this. So with any insect attack, for example, thrips are a prime example. They will eat the, the leaves and remove the chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll in the leaves are what actually cause photosynthesis and produce more energy within the plant. So if you've got a reduction in that, the plant can't produce as much energy. However, by that thrip attack, is the plant producing more terpenes to help defend itself, which then is more medicinal properties to it. So as you say, it's this balancing act between the two. And that's this is hopefully where my research will come in, will help to find out those optimal kind of levels, optimal ways, how the best way is to get the, the best out of the genetics of that plant as well, the genetic potential of that plant. But it's I never imagined I'd be here 10 years ago. <laughs> Well, yeah, building on that point, it sounds like you initially were going in with a kind of medical angle, i.e. the relationship with internal physiology of humans, and you've kind of ended up more studying plants. Was that was that as a consequence of your Glaxo experience? Or what, how did you move from studying humans and the effect there to plants? Exactly right. The experience at Glaxo Smith Climb, where I was just a number and... It was just not for me. For better phrases, I was a lab rat doing the same thing day in, day out. It was not for me. I also became quite frustrated with the, the system that we were within. Plants were a lot more fascinating in the fact that these were the ones that were producing the compounds of interest. You know, a lot of pharmaceuticals are derived. I would say 90% of pharmaceuticals are derived from a plant molecule, a molecule that a plant has derived. We all forget that things like cocodamol comes from opium, which comes from the opium poppy. You know, everything is all derived. And we obviously, we've got synthetics, but they do start off with these initial compounds that they're looking at. And the psilocybins are where they were started with LSD, which is a obviously a synthetic compound. But I think the actual, the way that plants work and the way that nature has developed these became much more of an interest. And 
The hydroponic industry is a very special industry and I'm very proud to have been part of it for 20 years. And I felt I had found my tribe. I felt that I had found somewhere I fit in. I was allowed to be myself and, and didn't hide to who I was. I could be exactly who I was and, and help people who needed help in being able to grow plants of whatever species that may be. Um, <laughs> 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 so I learned a lot from that industry, obviously, um, and still there. So it, as I say, it's a very special industry, and I'm, I'm so glad I did stay there. And the people are a very special set of people that I'm, as I say, very proud to have been part of. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense actually that that kind of journey that you've had. And I always ask it, but you know, you kind of answered it a bit in relation to your dad, but. Did you have any stigma at all from anyone along the way? Wider family, friends, any of that? Oh, I hid this for many, many years. I was a closet cannabis user for 20 years. And it wasn't until my son turned 16 that I kind of, I bursted out of the closet. And and a lot of people you you speak to will will mention that it's almost like coming out as being gay. And there was, there's people who spoke openly about it, that actually, you know, inspired me to do this. People like Hannah Deacon, who I saw stand up, and people like Carly Barton stand up on stage and talk about, you know, their their fight and their battle and their need for the use of cannabis. And then people like Simpa Carter as well, who who was brave enough to, you know, stand up and, and shout about this. And all of these people influenced how I felt about this and how that I actually need to speak my truth. I have experiences that other people haven't had that needed sharing to be brave about it. I spent a lot of time hiding about it and being ashamed of it. And I'm no longer ashamed. And the biggest fear for me was my son and the loss of my son and social services taking him away if I was to admit to being a cannabis user. But he's he's going to be 18 two weeks time and my little boy bless him so so again things have changed a lot my attitude has changed a lot and I feel I feel my epilepsy was given to me as a gift to be able to communicate about this it was given to me to be able to say that cannabis is a medicine to be able to communicate and show the powers of this as well and to be get to get away to get you know away from these stigmas that are involved we I still experience stigma but I think I now I just respond differently to it now and I stand proud shoulders back head up I will not be ashamed of this plant I will not be ashamed of what I do and I will not be ashamed what I fight for and it's strange when you take that mentality the stigma it doesn't affect you in the same way, but we've still got a very long way to go with this. Definitely a long way to go with it. Absolutely. And no, I couldn't agree with more. And, you know, it all stems from ignorance and kind of systems that were wrongly put in place. And now we're unpicking. But as you say, still a way to go. Hopefully we're, we're moving in the right direction. And as part of that, though, you know, the main topic of the show today is to talk about responsible marketing and you know, an element of cannabis myth busting, lots of stuff, lots of claims are being made of, you know, either overexcited people or, you know, cynical (laughs) money grabbing people will let you decide. But yeah, so we're going to talk about that as the topic. And maybe we just kick off. I mean, you're, you know, right in the heart of it, you hear and see lots of this stuff. What are some of the main myths that you hear? That cannabis is completely harmless. I think that is a big myth. I know people go, well, well, yeah, it is. But in comparison to what? What are we comparing this to? If we're comparing it to heroin, it is. You know, there's a lot less harm comes from cannabis than there does heroin. But we still don't know enough about the isolates that are being produced. They've only been around since the 1960s, really, when THC was first isolated by Raphael Mashur from Israel. So these isolated compounds, we don't really understand the long-term effects on humans, what the toxicity levels actually are. And when I talk about isolate for those who are maybe a bit of cannabis naive or not understanding, you have cannabis, the plant itself. So you have the flower, which produces all of the different cannabinoids and all of the terpenes there. 
that oil can then be extracted and then that oil can then be refined further down. I like to compare it a little bit like your sugar process. You have sugar beet, the plant itself, which has got the sucrose in there. You then produce molasses from that. That's a full plant extract. And then you refine that down to sucrose, the individual granulated sugar that we buy out of the shop. And that's it on its own. Now, we know that sugar in that refined form is damaging. It causes diabetes, long-term use. Are we going to have a similar problem with isolated CBD or isolated THC or isolated cannabinoids? And they're not balanced with the other compounds. So I think that is my number one kind of myth that everything in life comes with a risk. Everything can have some harm and effect and that's very dependent on the person using it and how it's being used. So I think that would be my number one kind of myth there. Yeah, I hear that, I hear that one a lot and it's, you know, I don't, there's nothing on this planet that is completely harmless. Even water, which is essential for life, you can drown in that. Right? Exactly. And so all of these things need to be taken in context. And yes, I hear that one too. So that's a great one to pull out as the first one. What other ones? Well, the other kind of myths is, is I think we've got, with regards to sort of, if we're talking about CBD and we're talking about the, the sort of cannabis as a whole, that one size fits all. That one, you know, it is the, I suppose the, this product is going to work for anxiety for everybody. And we need to look at the person's endocannabinoid system and look at that person as an individual as opposed to making a product that will be to cure one thing. I think we need to tailor it to more towards the needs of that patient. Okay, yeah, that's great. So with that in mind, do you see at some point us being able to test people's endocannabinoid levels as to be able to assess what would be best for them? Well, I think there's a lot of work being done in that kind of area. There is, as a friend of mine, she'd been diagnosed with actually having a deficiency within their endocannabinoid system. So there, there is the movement towards that, but it seems to be abroad. That seems to be, you know, internationally, there seems to be more. The research is occurring there, not so much within the UK at this moment. I really do want to see this kind of testing occurring. I think one of the biggest problems is with endocannabinoids such as anandamide, we don't store it. It's produced in response. So it's not quite a simple process to kind of test for it as uh, diabetes, where you're just looking with, you know, at the levels of sugar within your system. I really do hope this is something that will be, you know, coming on board. But again, it comes down to cost of these kind of tests as well and the cost effectiveness of it as well. But yeah, hopefully we shall see that, that kind of development in, in research coming forwards. Yeah, fingers crossed. Okay, so that's that's a couple of good ones there. And are you seeing any kind of myths around CBD specifically? That it's a silver bullet and it will cure everything. That's the big one, that it will cure everything. You can take it from, you know, anxiety to an aching foot to cancer to everything. And I think we need to be more realistic with what it's actually going to achieve. It's a quality of life improver. I know that cannabis itself will not cure my epilepsy. There is no cure to my epilepsy, but what it does is it aids with my sleep. It helps with appetite. It'll help with anxiety. It's not a cure and it's not the silver bullet, but because I get better sleep, I have got less risk of triggering a seizure. So it's about a quality of life improvement as opposed to this silver bullet, amazing cure-all. And I think this is also within the marketing is is kind of sort of upsetting me a little with it. Of It's been sold as, as I say, the silver bullet that it will cure absolutely everything. And I think we need to be more realistic about what, what you will achieve from this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And on the THC side, are you, what, are you, what are you hear? In relation to that, I mean, one of the points that you made before was, you know, it's completely harmless. And, and obviously, I've been lucky enough to have Ethan Russo on the show who has been studying cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which his studies are showing is linked to very high levels of and chronic use of THC. What are you seeing? Are you seeing any myths around THC? Well, we've got the, that big whole, oh, THC's the baddie, oh, that's the bad one, that's the intoxicating um, one, It's that, that's where the problems are. I think we've also need to look at terpenes as well, because 
a lot of allergies are related to terpenes. So if there's a washing powder, for example, you've been, you find that you have an allergic reaction to, terpenes are introduced into all of these kind of domestic products that we use every day. And some of the problems that we're actually seeing can be to do with the terpenes as opposed to the cannabinoids themselves. Now, chronic use of anything is always going to result in a problem, no matter what it is. As you say, water itself, if, if overused, sugar that we kind of, we don't talk about as much as I think we should. And as I say, these concentrated forms do, again, worry me a little bit that we, we don't know the long-term effects of it. But THE isn't as bad as we kind of it is made out to be used in balance with other cannabinoids it, it's a beautiful molecule and it, it works very well and it can have amazing effects it's very good for you know people who who want to increase their appetite and things and or need to be able to sleep it's demonizing thc and, and almost just saying that anything without thc is good for you anything with thc is bad for you and, and that is is a really big myth that it's about balance it's like anything in life it's having everything in balance yes i completely agree and i think with particularly in europe because it's seen as this sort of slightly naughty area in order to legitimize it people are saying oh no no i don't get no thc i'm I'm focused on cbd because i'm being sensible and and this is my sensible approach to it and so it does cast it in a good guy bad guy light which which is unfair for me it's about informed consumption as well so it's about knowing what you are consuming what you are eating and having a good breakdown of what you're actually you know, consuming, be that a certificate of analysis or information on the website of the actual vendor of the, the product, um, you can then make that informed decision to if you want to consume that or not. And I think we need more of that informed, you know, informed consumption. Yeah. And kind of any myths that you're sort of hearing around research? I suppose because I come from more of the growing kind of side of things, plant touching, around the burping one of these kind of myths that come about and um, what people will do is when they're drying their the product that the lids need to be opened um, in order to burp they call it the flower itself doesn't do that that's kind of one of the kind of myths around <laughs> this this kind of romanticizing and it's funny before the podcast we were talking about the entourage effect and you know is this a real thing and there is some there is some research coming through to show that the entourage effect is something real and that there is sort of terpenes that do interact with the endocannabinoid system as well. But it's a very nice romanticised way a marketing department can take something and, you know, they can already make infographics around them all working together and they all work in harmony and it does make a lovely story. But I, I do think there is... I am a believer and a supporter of the entourage effect of what I've seen. Isolated compounds don't have anywhere near the same effects. And studies that have been done in Canada, particularly on children with epilepsy, and the amount of CBD that is required as an isolate is nearly six times more than if used in a full plant extract. So the concentrations of what have been used is massively reduced. Is that the entourage effect? It would suggest to me that that's the entourage effect. I did a show on the endocannabinoid system with Dr. Rachel Knox, who's a US doctor. And one of the ways she described it, which I really liked, was almost you have the main compound that's sort of working on the receptors, but the other parts of the plant just help to basically break that down once it's served its purpose and they kind of efficiently remove it from your system. And that's kind of why the other parts of the plant work effectively together. And I kind of like that as a as a notion. Again, I don't know the, the research behind this, but that in my mind makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. It definitely makes a lot of sort of sense to me. And we will also, if you look at pharmaceuticals, you quite often prescribed ibuprofen for as an anti-inflammatory but then because that can possibly cause stomach upset you'll be prescribed something to prevent stomach upsets as well so is that the entourage effect but just in two different tablets as well yeah well it certainly suits a pharmaceutical business model doesn't it to yeah. <laughs> everybody buying several products 
you spoke about some of the, the kind of the other myths as well. I mean, at the moment, there's a lot of talk of a balanced product is actually giving a better high than, say, a very high THC. And it, it seems to be drilling home that at the moment within the industry, a high THC is what gets you high. But there's, there seems to be a motion at the moment, a kind of a trend of talking about that and actually a balanced product will give a much better effect. I've not seen any hard data on that. Doesn't mean it's not true or not. I just want some kind of references to go on with this to, to actually back some of some of the claims up. And I think this is part of marketing as well, is that we, we need to make sure that responsible marketing has information to back the claims up that they're making. You know, making sure that they're not making ludicrous claims that it's going to cure this. Where is your proof of this? You know, where is the hard data to say that, you know, it's going to stop seizures, your product? You know, please give us something a little bit more than marketing spiel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the difficulty around these sort of concepts are it's sort of blurring between medical and recreational in in that those are very subjective ideas on how you, you know, the experiences you have from cannabis and, you know, it's almost like wine, you know, there's a more complex taste to things and, and how do you quantify all of those things? I guess with medical effects is a bit more straightforward, right? Either it is alleviating a condition or it's not. And I guess that's part of it. I mean, you mentioned the, the recreational and medical side and it's, it's a funny one, this, this whole kind of splitting the two up and, I think there's just really one kind of area as such as that we say it's recreational, but quite often people are medicating and not realising they're medicating, that they're, people will have a glass of wine on an evening to wind down to help with their anxiety or to help them sleep. So they're using that alcohol medicinally. So isn't this the same for cannabis? I absolutely agree. I think that pandemic was like in a massive example of that you know everyone everyone said oh you know when we were in lockdown everyone's like oh, five o'clock i have a glass of wine to take the edge off and it's like exactly that that is a wellness kind of solution to what was a stressful situation for for most people so yeah i mean i do you know just to kind of riff on a tangent there i wonder what the sort of profiles of land race strains are like in terms of cannabinoid profile because you know, they're, they're kind of grown naturally and, you know, without human intervention, supposedly. Well, they're going to be kind of quite different then because you tend to find any wild type, your land race or a wild type variety of a plant will be massively different in their profile of secondary metabolites as a whole because they're being exposed to different kinds of stressors. As I kind of mentioned at the beginning, the reason the plants produce a lot of these compounds uh, as a defense mechanism. It's either due to abiotic or biotic stress. So you've got abiotic, which comes from the environment. So that can be drought stress. And then you've got biotic stresses such as insect attack, fungal attack, herbivore attack. And the plant will then produce these either methods of prevention. So a lot of the terpenes have antimicrobial Effect. So they'll be very good at killing any fungus that may start to live on the surface of the leaf. So depending on what that plant has been exposed to, depending how it will then evolve and produce more of these actual compounds. And in some ways, putting a plant into the perfect environment with the perfect temperatures, with a straight 12 hour cycle day after day, it's going to become very boring in its way. It's going to go, well, why do I need to produce these terpenes? I haven't got any reason to do it. I'll just, yeah, keep growing flour. Do, 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 do. Whereas give them a bit of stress, chuck them out in the wild, get them exposed to, you know, 16 different insects, a bit of powdery mildew, and, you know, a cow comes along and eats it. It's going to go, right, we're going to produce some badass molecules here now. We're going to stop all of these attacking you. So... The profiles are going to be massively different. I think we've also got the other factor now of we bred for high THC because that's what the the market has demanded. People perceive that THC, because that's one of the dominant molecules that the plant produces, the more of that, the higher they're going to get. And that's what, what the market has demanded. So we've bred varieties for that. We've also bred them for different flavours as well. So there's a connoisseur market which has come about and people are a lot more aware of 
that they want something that tastes a particular way. We've got a lot of kind of fruity flavours coming through at the moment as well. And people are wanting that because they want to enjoy what they're consuming, It not just tasting like some straw. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's the evolution of this market. Okay, cool. So as we come towards the end, you know, positive steps and, and advice in general for both businesses and patients and consumers in relation to the information that they receive about cannabis how can they be better informed let's say do your research and don't just go to one source i really do feel you need to go to kind of multiple sources of information don't just take dave down the road as gospel and what they're saying because they're confident in what they're saying you know check up the references that we're referring to ask more questions don't be afraid to ask questions as well a good reputable company will happily answer all of your questions and not deviate from the truth they'll happily provide you with a certificate of analysis they'll happily be open about the process as they go through how to produce or how they go through their manufacturing processes where their products come from is it an isolate is it full plant extract how it was grown ask those questions that's kind of what I, all i can encourage people to do is to ask more questions i think that's a fantastic way to round things out yes i think often people get worried about asking questions they're worried about sounding stupid but actually it's essential and you know it's actually a cool reason i started this podcast because I gave up not wanting to sound stupid a long time ago. (laughs) It gives gives me a chance to do that. (laughs) I think the more we learn, though, the more we realise we don't know. I know I certainly sometimes think, oh, why have I asked this question? And so just opened a can of worms that I really didn't need to open. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is fantastic. Kelly, really appreciate getting you on the show and you're sharing your amazing wisdom with us and look forward to having you back on again soon. No, not a problem. Just give us a shout when you want me on. Will do. Cheers, Kelly. Take care. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.